Hey, welcome in everybody to the latest edition of the Grittiest Take as we're here rarely this uh, calendar year, but here after a Flyers victory as we might have to uh, celebrate on the streets after that one like they hugged Patrick Brown on the bench. But uh, I'll ask Vasily, uh, how are you doing today after a rare victory in the calendar year of 2022? I mean, it's going great seeing the Flyers win an afternoon game, which they typically haven't had the most success in over the last decade. First That's thing. True. <laughs> and then seeing them snap a six game losing streak, not having it, you know, continue to a seven uh, game losing streak is great to see. And then also, I think a lot of positives uh, to take out of that game, especially for a team where there hasn't been much uh, positive so far this season. What did you think there, Joe? Yeah, no, I think there was a, a primary one was to start. Uh, you saw Cam Atkinson, who we talked about a bit in the Nitty Gritty podcast, and so he's been colder of late, make a beautiful pass to Drew to score 11 seconds in. And then he himself is, of course, the guy on a weird pass by Scott Long that wasn't a good one that hit off of the opposing player, went back to Atkinson, stuck with it, and scored the goal. Obviously, he stepped up eventually in this game and, and got hot again when we kind of needed him the most. So what did you think of him going from being the guy we said was cold and now all of a sudden with the lineup back with the fair, he's back and everything. It seemed like he settled back into comfortability. Uh, I think he was due for a game like this uh, that we saw out of him. I mean, he's been in a bit of a slump. I think it was only two goals in the last 17 or 18 games or something along those something lines like uh, coming into this one. So obviously nice to see him get on the score sheet. The Flyers need him as they're, you know, their scoring depth hasn't been the greatest as of late. Uh, it's been more bottom sixers contributing. So it's nice to see, you know, that top line get on the score sheet and kind of control the game for the team. Uh, and, and you can see just, uh, the jump in his game and the mo and the high motor intensity just to start off right off the draw. He goes in, wins a key puck battle, crucial puck battle, makes a nice backhand pass to Giroux. And then you see uh, Giroux snipe at home uh, blocker side there on Samsonov. And then even on the second goal, just the skill that it would takes, uh, you know, to corral the puck after a pass that didn't directly go to his tape corrals it roofs at top shelf on Samsonov who has been really good this year so it just shows you know Atkinson's likely going into another one of those type of hot streaks and you know scores are streaky in the NHL and Atkinson is one of those streaky kind of guys when he gets on those streaks usually he has a five six seven eight game period where he's going hot and kind of dips down again so I think that's what we, what we can expect from him coming out of this one uh, in in the few games in the future here, just nice to see as we were saying the Flyers get a win, and for them to you know um, build on some good habits because they started the game out really good and and they really haven't been controlling much of their latest games played. And this one, I would say, up until you know the last 10, 15 minutes, they did control a lot of the play there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think they. Uh... Carter Hart stepped up big as well oh, yeah. in different moments of this game when they did allow high percentage chances. But uh, I think overall they started the game well and then were able to defend the lead. But I did think the one thing that I didn't love about this game is I think they tried to get too much into the mindset of we have the lead. Oh, Let's yeah. just try to keep the lead where they definitely, I think, at the end of the game could have pushed it a little bit more, where it seemed like it was basically stay back. We haven't won in a while. Let's just try to defend the lead. And that's kind of when Carter Hart, which we know he can do, but that's when he had to stay on his head more because they really didn't close out as well as you would like to see them close out defensively. Oh, yeah. I agree there, too. And I think it's tough uh, when you see a team that's battling a lot of injuries, obviously, to keep it up consistently for 60 minutes. Like, uh, you know, they were playing earlier in the first period because in the first they dominated. Then as soon as you saw that... Uh, you know, power play goal get allowed by them uh, from TJ Oshie in the slot. You kind of see them dip. And uh, that kind of goes back uh, to what we were talking about on getting gritty with it earlier in the week is, you know, once something spirals for the team, typically, or once, or once you know, they make one mistake, typically things tend to spiral for this team. Uh, so like almost fragility mentally. And we did see a bit of that, right? Uh, they got scored on and you saw the caps push and push. Uh, but the Flyers, uh, you know, bent there, they didn't break, which is good to see. And that's an improvement from there in that, in, in that area. And for them there in that area, because, you know, as we were alluding to on getting gritty with it, 
a lot of the times once they let that one goal in, it just ends up, you know, spiraling, uh, and then they let in a few more, and then they end up getting dominated when they were actually like controlling the play. So it's good to see them take baby steps there and not see them get completely dominated, even though the Caps kind of, you know, controlled the play later in the game. But ultimately, it's good for it's good for them to get a win because even though a lot of fans would probably say, you know, it's more about the draft position now. Uh, there's a lot of young guys on this team that are going to be, you know, with this roster moving forward, going into next season, you want to see them start building a winning culture again and building those winning habits because it's hard to break out of losing habits and a losing culture when, you know, it's a lot of negativity on the ice constantly. Yeah, no, yeah, they definitely uh, were building in the uh, right direction. Uh, for for me, I think the most impressive thing was the start. Carter Hart also came back off of an eye infection. Yeah. He didn't look like he missed a beat uh, whatsoever. But a guy that, of course, came back today, I'm trying to see the exact minutes he put, 20 minutes and 28 seconds. Joel Faraby played today, got an assist. Yeah, lots uh, of PK time as well. As well, you know, also had a lot of PK time, a plus one. Uh, I thought he was a huge – that's what I think him – Therby, Drew, Atkinson, even though Ratcliffe played good when he filled it on the first line, it seems like when that was together, that's when Cam was going his best, that's when Joel was going his best, and yeah. then Drew could just play with anybody, so you can, he's a different It's character. a different but, dynamic, too, but, I would say. Yeah, I think that's the best first line, where with him back, it seems, that's what I was saying earlier when I mentioned with Cam, it seemed like that made Cam play looser, and that's yeah. when you saw Cam Atkinson play to the effect he did today. But on the Joel Fairby side, I thought he, as well as Patrick Brown, who we're throwing to here too when we talk about the PK, those two being back for the penalty kill, it really showed a complete difference in the penalty kill that's been pretty struggling of late to actually be able to close in on people, cut down lanes more, and yeah. actually succeed in a lot more facets. Um, what did you think about those two's impact uh, coming back uh, for the penalty kill especially? Uh, I think Faraby had a really great game uh, first off. I mean, he played a ton of minutes as we saw. And I mean, you could see at least in some plays, I, I, I think, you know, the shooting and the timing with the shot maybe wasn't there fully because you saw him kind of going in for the big one timers and some of those big shots and he, he wasn't able to get it off as quickly, but that's going to come with time. He hasn't played in a while in a game situation, but just having him on that line, uh, I think it makes Giroux and Atkinson play a lot looser you can see that, but it also gives them a lot more opportunity because now if you're a defense, you not only have to worry about a Giroux and an Atkinson, but you also have to worry about Faraby, who arguably, I mean, is one of the most skilled fours on the Flyers team. And that's something to take away from Ratcliffe. But, you know, a guy who's a rookie just feeling out his way in the league who's been playing well, isn't going to have the same effect as a Joel Faraby, you know, who's shown and proven that he can be a top scorer in the league yeah, when he's at his best. Right. So that's a major thing. And then uh, with the PK, he's shown that, you know, his defensive instincts are great. He has a great defensive stick, great positioning, usually in the right places uh, on the ice. So that helps a lot with the Flyers PK. And I mean, you're effectively swapping out Willman for Fairby in that spot, right? Because Willman was getting those PK reps earlier. And obviously that's an upgrade there. No slight to Willman, but it just it just is. Fairby's a better player. Um, and then with Brown, it's just, I think, more stability uh, on the fourth line. I mean, he's good defensively. He's good on the draws. And he's willing to lay it on the line for the team, which we saw with that, you know, uh, possibly game-saving block there on, on Ovechkin just to end the game. Overall, his presence, I think, makes the fourth line a lot better defensively. And um, just puck retrieval's positioning on the PK helps out as well. And then you don't have to play, I mean, a Giroux as many minutes on the PK, which kind of freshens him up for more scoring opportunities five on five on the power play and then maybe getting him more offensive minded starts versus focusing on the defensive side of things where obviously with Sean Couture out and Kevin Hayes out, you want Giroud to kind of be your main offensive catalyst. So those guys are big, um, you know, additions in this, in the overall scheme of the team's game and, and where they're trying to go offensively. I think uh, that some people might not think about uh, and both of them had great games. And another guy I'd like to bring up that I think had a good game as well is uh, Ivan Provrov. He didn't play that well last game uh, against the Blues. Had some big giveaways. Uh, this game, I thought his first pa uh, first pass out of the zone, outlet pass-wise, was really, really strong. He wasn't turning it over much at all this game, and he was a plus two, so good to see him rebound as well. 
Yeah, yeah, because Provorov's been the guy. Cam Atkins has been cold. Provorov's yeah. been ice cold a lot of late. So oh, um, yeah. it was nice to see him get back and uh, get to it. But well, how we said on uh, getting gritty with it about Provorov, when he has time off on the power play, he seems to work better in his other facets. Giroux's great on the PK, but when he has less minutes, he's obviously going to play better in other facets. Exactly, so like exactly. you were saying, having uh, Brown, who is one of the probably more underrated PKers in the league when healthy, and then also having Fairby, who is, everyone already knows is one of the better uh, two-way guys. So I, I think that really did make the immediate impact. Um, the one thing, though, on the not as positive, not that he necessarily played a bad game, let's see here, 1148, 64% in the faceoff dot, a plus one. Uh, but the one thing, he played fine, but Derek Broussard, in my opinion, should just not be in the lineup. Oh, it, I would it, it, I would agree it, there. It's, fi- it's fine that he played fine, and like he, I don't think he's going to play bad because he's not a bad player. He's a fine yeah, he didn't hurt player. Them. This, yeah, he's a fine player, and he played great to start the year. And that's why I really liked him when he first came here. But when you're not a contending team and you're a team that's playing for nothing at this point, Derek Broussard's not a guy that needs to be in your lineup. He's a guy that should be sent to Tampa or a guy that should be sent to um, somebody that's competing, that he can do what he did at the beginning of the season and just be the face-off offensive guy that he was for the Flyers on, like, a very good third line. or like I agree. I agree there 100%. I think Broussard, like, to start the first period off, I saw him, he had a couple nice passes to Mayhew. Uh, he had a nice pass to Mayhew in the slot. That was about as noticeable as it got for him after the first period. And there's no slight against Broussard. I, I like him as a player, and I think he can be a useful addition, as you said. But that's more of if you're a contending team. Right now, if you're a team like the Flyers, who is trying to, you know, get their young guys to build the right habits and develop their younger players for the future moving forward, you need to have a guy like Morgan Frost in the lineup tonight because this is an important game for the Flyers, I would say, because it's, you know, trying to build those winning habits and learn how to close out a game. And I think a game like this is more valuable for a guy like Frost because he would have got those types of minutes maybe in the third period where, okay, he's protecting a lead as a third line center. He's learning how to play defensively with a lead in his own zone late in the game against a top team like the Capitals. That's a valuable experience where Broussard's already been there, done that in his career. And uh, to go back to what you were saying, you know, time to ship him off to a Tampa, to a Florida, to a contending team that, you know, is looking to have a long playoff run. I think that's uh, might, you know, be the reason as to why the Flyers are kind of pushing to get him back in the lineup because of that injury trouble he's, you know, suffered previously. I think they just want to showcase to maybe other teams that might be interested at the deadline in him that, okay, look at Derek uh, here. He can play, you know, on a fourth line, could be in a third line role for you if you need him, but he's, he's healthy. So I think that's the main thing. And that's probably why the Flyers have him in there. Um, to be honest, it's to show that, okay, he's back from the injury. He can play maybe five, 10 games for us in succession show teams. He's getting healthy. And then from that point, maybe move him off and then get Frost and back, uh, full time. And, you know, just learning the every days of being that, you know, NHL centerman and what he needs to do to just become a more effective player offensively and defensively. What, what would you think about that? I mean, I agree with you in a sense. That's why they're putting him in, but I also agree with what Russ said. It's not going to help us trade value. Oh, yeah. Whatever you're getting it, it for Derek won't. Broussard, you're getting for Derek Broussard. So yeah, that's why, won't. from that standpoint, there's no reason for him to be in. That, that, yeah. That's the way I look at it. Because also, like you you said, Derek Broussard's been there, done that with being in the position to defend a lead. He's been in the position to do it. He's never really done it. Yeah. Derek Broussard's never been accused of being good at defense. <laughs> no, no. Like, no. that's not his thing. His thing is being a quicker skater center that can win faceoffs and be, uh, if if he has to be on your second power play unit. If not, just be a solid, good bottom nine or bottom six, excuse me, offensive forward, where yeah. that's kind of what he's been most of his career. You don't get him for defense. So it, no. part of the reasoning is, oh, well, Frost, we still want to see him develop his defense more and use that, use him a time away to think about best ways to do that. Brass ain't that great at defense. So, yeah, like, that's to me, that doesn't really go together either. Where I, It's fine if you play him a couple games, but, like, I don't think he's a guy you have to play to the deadline. If you just play him a couple games, you should just trade him then because you're going to get whatever. Yeah, it's not going to be – exactly. Yeah. It's not going to be more uh, – his value's not going to go up 
uh, for the fact of him playing more games, right? So I think you're 100% right. Get him back, maybe get him to play a couple games just to show teams that, hey, he's not like going to be injured every time he steps in a game the next game afterwards, you know what I mean? And then just get him out of here because... Well, I think a team you might get the most from for a center that can bring more offense like Brayus, just because they don't have the deepest center core, would be Minnesota. Yeah, it would make sense. Minnesota I, might I say, that. we'll give you a fourth or we'll even give you a third because we don't even have a prototypical third-line center. Like, we've been yeah. using Victor Rask and we've been using Nico Sturm, who's a great fourth-line center, but he's not really a third-line center. And Victor exactly. Rask is more of a fill-in player than a consistent third-line center. At the and they've season. been waving him most of the season, too, Victor Rask. So. Exactly, yeah. So, like, it's not like they really they really have shown signs of, oh, we want this dude to stay in our lineup for the season. Yeah. So, um, I think that, that could play into that um, as well. And then imagine Broussard if he's freaking Matthew Bolton for some cool. reason. For some yeah. uh, for he's going to He's going to bring his numbers up, I'd say. Um, yeah, what do you sure. think? Like he, what did you think for? Oh, sorry to interrupt. What did you think about Rista Linen's game today? Because I thought he he played well and he was a key in you know that uh, go ahead goal that Atkinson scored for sure off that hit. I thought Rista Linen played really well today. At the same time, I'm not upset that he declined six years for six point one. Oh, hundred percent. It was. I think it was six point three million. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Um, that would have been a Chuck Fletcher yeah, disaster. Back. To, to a T. That, that's him going back to his Minnesota, the, what destroyed the wild at that time, which was just signing people for stupid money. Um, so I would say Rast- Rastus Salon is a very good defenseman that has played well for the Flyers this year. They should use the way he's played this year and actually being one of the rare people they put in the right spot to get the best value for him because this is probably the most value he's going to have. You shouldn't yeah. be the team that's paying him six point because you need – you're not one physical better in the offensive zone, the defensive zone, right shot defenseman away exactly. from being a contending team. If no, you're there's... that, then, yeah, you could pay him $6 million, which is still not the best thing to do, but it's no. more of we don't give a crap because – we're go, we're contending, and this is the last thing we think we need. So we're paying whatever we need. More yeah. understandable in that scenario, yeah. right? And it's understandable in our scenario. It's not understandable to pay him that money. No. It, it, it's um, it it kind of just falls into the category of flyers, things that you're going to look at, like Bridge, like Cavier, and immediately when it's done, it's not like you dislike the player off the bat. You're more just going, why would you give them this money? Like, yeah, there's more there's more needs that are, you know, need to be addressed. I think that are more important than a guy like Ristolainen and kind of what he brings to the table. And he's been good this year and I feel the same way and he was really good this game and this is usually when Ristolainen has a great game, this is what you're seeing from him, right? He's physical, he brings the physicality, backs off other teams, you know, forwards coming into the zone with that physicality and lays hits. Also good passer up the ice too. And, and we saw that, you know, today makes a big hit, passes it up the ice, and the Flyers get on a three-on-one due to that play. And, I mean, if you are the Flyers, you want to just send that video clip to every team that you're going to try to trade him to and say, this is what he can bring for you. And, you know, in the playoffs when physicality ramps up even more and, the you know, the referees put that whistle away, I think he's going to be an attractive asset for a lot of those contending teams. Um, so I think they'll definitely be able to move him for – for sure, a first-round pick. I don't know if they're going to recoup the exact value that they traded for him. Probably not. But if you get a first from him for him at this point, you might as well move on from him. And I think it's probably a blessing in disguise that he turned down that six point three million because having that six point three cap on the books for six more years, uh, you know, would not have been ideal when you look at the rest of you know the holes the team needs to fill moving forward. That money can be spent a lot better elsewhere. So I think definitely we're on the same page with that one. But nice to see him have a good game, and nice to see him contribute to the win because all that does is really boost up his value for the Flyers going forward. So, well, the funny thing is with how they've been playing, the team that if you're going to trade them, because I don't think in terms of the East in our division, the Hurricanes, Rangers, or Pens need Rasmus or Salon. No, uh, I think Tony D went down for Carolina. 
So it could be something to watch. He's out for Maybe. the next month or two. But they're probably yeah. going to target Chitrin. They're probably going to target Jacob They'll Chitrin probably target instead. someone that fits more because Ristolan is not going to replace Tony D'Angelo. Ex- yeah, exactly. So that's why I, I don't know if that – But I think St. Like, Louis could be a fit. Yeah, um, that would be him. a fit in the West. But in our division, the team that would actually be the fit is today's opponent. Yeah, them the and have not played that great since 2022, and part yeah. of that has been because their defense hasn't played as good since yeah. the start of the calendar year. So them or the Leafs, I'd say for the East are the big targets. Yeah, them the Leafs. Um, it depends how much the Bruins think they're in it, but yeah, the Bruins I can see that. I can see that defensive help, but. At the same time, if I'm the Bruins, I'm not giving up a first round pick for Ristolainen this year because no, no. I'm not, I'm not Rasmus Ristolainen away from winning the Stanley Cup. Yeah, so, exactly. If you're the Lightning, the Panthers, or the Maple Leafs, and you want to add, then that's completely different. That makes a lot of sense because they're a lot closer, and you could argue with the Leafs like that's what they're really lacking. Like def- defensively, first of all, they're not the strongest team, and then also they usually get pushed around in the playoffs. So as from being from Toronto and just knowing, uh, you know, the fan bases here's uh, reaction to their defensive play, at least this season. And, um, you know, going back years in the playoffs here, that's something that probably would really help them. So I would look for the Leafs to be really active for him. If they, if they don't get him, I mean, a Justin Braun too, I think is an option. Yeah. An interesting team, too, would be going back to Minnesota if we're talking about Risto, just because they could yeah. use more help on defense. And you could try to do a uh, – probably won't happen, but you could try to do a combo thing there. Where Giroux and Risto together. Guys, well, maybe, well, that would be a huge trade. I was thinking more Broussard and Risto. Just oh, Broussard and Risto. That, yeah, that's probably yeah. – that's more realistic for sure. Yeah, yeah because they need uh, the center help, and then you would – probably get an extra like if they're they were just going to give you a first they might give you like a first and a third or a first and a fourth like yeah. something like that then you um, bump up like the value on Broussard maybe yeah yeah exactly so I think yeah like if you got a third in that deal I don't think straight up you would have got a third for Broussard for no pro- probably so not. like that's what that's why I feel like if you do that you might get a better deal like you like you were saying too for for Brass. but when it comes overall, a good question to ask, because we kind of hinted at it as well. When you look at the team right now, if you had to pick three, probably isn't enough in a season that, as Jamie said, is the dark season of the Flyers. If you had to pick five guys that you would say, if management is saying, if we get a good deal for these people, they are available. Who do, other than Claude Giroux being one of those five, obviously. What do you? Th- who do you think those people are that management's not going to? Can we like strike out the UFAs like a Braun Risto? Like we're already assuming they're gone, right? Yeah, yeah, we're already assuming though. Yeah, the the Giroux and the guys that we're like assuming are gone for UFA reasons. Yeah, we don't have to mention them. Okay, um, five guys that I'm getting rid of. Ooh. Not that you're getting rid of, but that you think management management has, oh management's gonna look like at list that they're gonna yeah. say if we get a great offer for these guys, we're not turning it down, basically. Um hmm. I mean Morgan Frost, probably one of them. If they get a great offer for, for right. him, I think he's probably on his way out. Uh another guy is likely gonna be or probably both. I mean, Provrov and Sandheim, you could see that. I mean, I could see it because they haven't had the best seasons, though Sandheim's looked a lot better. Provorov hasn't looked that great this year, but personally for me, I wouldn't trade those guys because they're very young defensemen still in the league. So unless it's like a package where you're blown away and you're saying, okay, if I don't make this deal, I'm an idiot, like something like along those lines. Um, Because you have to be open to everything, right? I mean, where the team is, you can't can't be selective here. Like if somebody blows you away with a, an offer for Ivan Provorov, you got to trade him. But personally, I'm not looking for that trade. It's more if a team comes calling. Same with Sanha. I'm not looking to trade those guys. It's more if a team you know beats my door down uh, and says, "Hey, we want this guy. We're willing to give up all this." And sure, go ahead. So those two guys, I guess you could throw in there. I think management would be open to it if it blows their socks off. Um. I mean, JVR, I, I think he's gone. And I, I could, I, I think the thing is with JVR, is, I think we should be expecting him to be like traded as soon as this NHL uh, entry draft, right? At the latest. I wouldn't be surprised to see him gone at the deadline because we've, I mean, I've heard rumors 
uh, are seeing things tweeted out for, you know, from Pierre Lebron, Elliot Friedman, that Arizona is looking to take salary on. Cause they only have, I think six guys signed past the season. Yeah. They, like need six meet, or eight or yeah like they need to, they need to meet the cap floor. So JVR is a prime target. They need guys with cap space. I mean, he wouldn't be a bad pickup for them just because he's still going to get you, you know, a decent amount of goals and he's got a high salary for one year. So it makes sense for them. Um, and then for a fifth guy, ah, uh, Hmm. It's, it's hard to really put a name on that one. Uh, just off the top of my head. I mean, I could see, you know, I could see Atkinson getting moved on from, which might be surprising to some, but the only reason I would say that, uh, is just because of the salary in the term. I mean, if somebody offers you a good value, good value for him and you're not expecting to be contending, in the next, in the near future, you'd have like to look at Like if Nashville offered you like Philippe Tomasino and a really good pick for Cam Atkinson, you might be like, well, why wouldn't I? Small, quick yeah. skater, like Cam. Similar, like, similar. You know, it, they're kind of similar guys. So yeah, I might, you might look at that and go. I don't think they're looking, I don't think they're looking to trade an Atkinson pro for Sandheim though. I think they're going to try to go into next season with those three guys again. Yeah. Uh, and kind of add pieces. That's my perspective. How about you? Who would you think? Yeah, I don't think they're going to look to trade those guys. The guy that I would more say, even though I really love them as a player, and when I talked about it on um, Lance's podcast, um, the Hockey Writer Zing, he was on a player that I would say to keep, but a guy I could see if they get blown away just because of his value on both ends is Long. Long yeah. is going on 28. He's not in like he he's a little bit older than the other people we talked about. Sandheim, exactly. both Provi and Sandheim are exactly twenty five. So, yeah. uh, yeah, uh, and they're defensemen. Like defensemen take a lot longer sometimes to get into that yeah. like prime. And also, career. defense is a lot more like Scott Long's a great two way center, but the Flyers have a lot of centers. You guys talked about that with Russ. We don't yeah. have a lot of Provorov Sandheim level defense. No, until exactly. they until other people show us they're at Prova off at San Juan level. So like that's the difference there too. I feel like he could be a guy. I would say Oscar is more back towards one of the untouchable guys just because of how well he's been playing. Like he had yeah. a bad first twenty five games and then since has yeah. played. I think that's game. more like conditioning related though for him. Yeah, exactly. Like, like you could see him. A... Yeah, he but, played yeah, his way kind of into it. Season. Yeah, you're coming up with one of the worst, not, not the one of the, the worst disease probably on the planet. It's yeah. going to take you a little bit to work your way back. Um, oh, yeah. And, and that, that's just kind of is what it is. And, and actually, while we're on the topic of that, a prayer sent up and uh, well wishes to Rodion Amirov and his family. Yeah, you know, huge prayers to him. Hopefully, um, you know, he can fight through it and we're all we're all with him moving forward because that's that's terrible news to hear and just hope hopefully he can get better soon. I think he's a perfect, similar to Oscar, has the perfect personality to get through it because he's Mr. Positivity, just like Lindblom's Mr. Smiles, yeah. Mr. Positivity. I watched the interview that they translated with him. He was still smart. This dude, you, could t- you couldn't tell anything. Was I saw that as well, exactly. From his interview. Yeah. And that's the, that's and the those, mindset to have, right? You got to fight. Exactly. That's the mindset. You have to have Brian Boyle talked about that as well. There's dark times, but you have to have the positivity. So, like, all those guys that are going through it. Um. Well, for me, I would say other than Walden, you hit the nail on the head with JVR. If they can eat something and get him going by the deadline, they probably do. But yeah, I don't know and the thing is, too, just to interrupt quickly, I think with JVR, a team like Arizona is looking to take on all that cap space. I don't think they'd have to eat anything. It might be like, okay, give us a third or a second round pick, and then we'll take him off your hands. That might not be something the Flyers want to do, but I think – if you're giving up a second rounder and then you get $7 million off your books that you can use to kind of add or just spend that money elsewhere. I think that's something they got to look into doing. The, yeah. That's the an other anchor. side. Is, the other side is though, um, where's our trust level with Chuck Fletcher spending $7 million that he gets off the books. Yeah. That's still ABR, thing. Still because thing. he just offered Rasmus first in six years for six. But again, I like Rasmus first to line. And Not for that money. Different. Is not the best at evaluating money to how, like, where you should be on the pay scale, basically. Like, yeah. with what he paid Parisi, what he paid Sutter, both were very good players, but not 11 million or whatever the hell he paid. Well, like, like, like he, yeah. he always tends to be one of those GMs that goes up a scale. 
He'll overpay a little bit to ensure he gets the deal done. That's what it looks yeah, like, at least with Kevin GM, Hayes. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Where most GMs seem to be more like Stevie Y or more like Sackick and figure out how to convince people, well, we're a great city. Look at all these prospects. Look at all this stuff we have coming with you to play with. And then that's why it seems like they take less money. Why the Flyers don't try to do things like that is absolutely beyond me, but it doesn't seem like they do with the way they offer contracts. So maybe Danny Briere coming in will be able to help with that over time. But Chuck Fletcher, that's the quickest way out of Philadelphia, I think. If he yeah. goes into – because Brett Flair, like I said, and I kind of realized this, um, and then I'll say who my other three players are, is the guy I've kind of been complimenting all along. Because I've been saying we've been dra- – I've liked the drafts we had since Fletcher came in. He doesn't he's the draft that. guy. Yeah, he's the draft yeah, guy. Yeah, Brett Flair's the draft guy, and then the scouts are the draft guy. So that's not even Chuck. And then I've said I've liked the scouting that we picked up, like the Hodgson's, the other people of the world. That has nothing to do with Chuck. That's all the minor league scouts. So, like, like all the people I've been complimenting have nothing to do with the guy that's the GM and the president. Yeah. It has to do with everybody below him. So, like, it's more – it's great that like, – I like people that delegate and want, like, Hextall and are too hard-headed to delegate. That was what I thought Hextel's biggest flaw was. Yeah, he's obviously put some good pieces in place for like a scout's perspective and with exactly. Slayer there. Uh, yeah, and, and made some good hirings like the people from LA and different and bringing in Nick Schultz, Schultz and everything. But he does, you have to then pull your weight. When you delegate it, all the people below you are pulling their weight. What the, the thing you're assigning yourself to do, you have to pull yours on. And that's the issue we have right now. Fletcher hasn't really pulled his weight being the guy at the top, but everybody below him, in my opinion, actually has probably a B to a B plus, maybe even better grade since they've been brought in by the team, where he's probably at a C and teetering lower. So, like, yeah. like he's he, he, he has the same grade as the start of his name. So, <laughs> for, for right now, and it, and it might go lower uh, if, the t- if he keeps – going the way he's going. That's why I think this is the make or break offseason for Fletcher, because if we have an offseason again like last year where you spend a bunch of money and it leads to just oblivion again, I, I would say he's going by. Yeah, probably Briere's in that position coming into next offseason, I would say. Yeah, or by Christmas. I don't even know if he'll yeah. make it through next season. If next season's like this, I don't think Dave Scott's letting he, Fletcher. No, he Dave Scott not, might not make it through either at that point. <laughs> yeah, or you might just. But the thing is, I don't know if Brett Flair, because he's so good with the scouting and drafting, I don't know how good of an actual top guy he would be, because that's what he's focused on. Yeah, he might even be in consideration because he has more experience than Briere would then be the assistant. But yeah, and I feel like I Flair know. and Flair and Fletcher are a bit of a tandem. Like they went back to Minnesota together, so I think it's like a tandem deal. If Fletcher's gone, Flair's probably he gone might, as well. He might just jump ship. Yeah. But also, if you offered him the top job, I don't think he's ever been in. Oh, actually. no. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So he, might, he might stick around for that because, um, again, he's the guy that's kind of been firing some people, bringing in new scouting people and kind of revamping that. Uh, that hasn't really been Chuck Fletcher. So, but when it comes to the other three people, because I said Lawton and Van Riemsdyk, um, Somebody you mentioned somebody that I think they'll look at if they get a great offer, but I I too don't want to trade him because we have him on a good deal for five eight seven five to twenty twenty five. If you get a good offer, you'll probably trade Atkinson. But again, I think it has to be for somebody like a Tomasino or Tulvin and yeah. like something like that. You have to get somebody that's young that that team really just wants a very proven veteran in, and you getting a very good developing young forward. That's the only way I'm trading Cam Atkinson really. Where yeah, the I same agree. goes with Lawton, uh, and this and with JVR, the same does not go with him. I just want to get his cap out of here. So whatever you get for JVR, that that that's a completely different. That's that that one's in a completely different category. Rista Line and then is the other guy. Obviously, uh, he is in the UFA, but um, he's a guy that I don't know if Fletcher, which I think is stupid in its own right. Sometimes GM signs somebody and then trade them because they go well. Now they have the contract but i don't think that was the smartest contract to sign somebody and then trade them because you were giving them the, pe- the best value yeah um so uh i think he'll be going but in terms of a non-ufa i think because of what you can get for him and sandheim's building up 
as odd as this is to say, and I don't want him gone, the Flyers probably have a higher percentage chance of trading Grover. Because I don't think you're going to get blown away with an offer for Travis Sanheim. I think Edmonton and or the Stars and or the like, like teams like that that really need more, even the Kings, they need more defensive help. Like teams like that might blow you away with an offer for someone like Provorov, where Sandheim's more at the B plus probably trade. Yeah, um, like I think I think around the league, I th- sorry to interrupt. I think around the league and just in league circles and things like that is, you know, people view Sandheim as a second pair guy. Uh, yeah. And Provorov's viewed as the first pair of guys, so he's going to obviously get more value. So I agree with that there. Personally, I think the Flyers are going to want to see, like they still probably want to see Ellis and Provorov together since so they didn't really get to play at all. So that's why I think they're going to hold on to him. And, that, and then if the bad play Agreed. continues, then they'll probably end up moving on from him down the line. I think he just needs, uh, you know, a solid defensive partner, like we talked about on getting gritty with it, right? Like you have Justin Broad playing way above his head. And it's really all on Provorov. So I think if you get him some help, you see him return to form. Um, but we'll we'll see. I mean, it, like I said, and like what you were saying, if they if the offer makes sense and it's good value, you have to look at it because you're not contending right now. And no matter though the team wants to get back to that point next season, it's really hard to turn it around from where they are right now just in one off season. So you got to be realistic, right? Agree. I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty, but the more I look at it now, um, Braun's obviously better at just getting the puck off of a guy's stick, and then he is better at outletting it than this guy I'm about to mention. But signing Larson last year, yeah, after he went to Seattle instead of letting him go to Seattle, probably would have worked perfectly with Provorov. Because I've yeah. watched him a good bit in Seattle too again this year, and it seems like with Hackstall. Hackstall's kind of freed him a little bit than, more than Tibbet did, where yeah. he hasn't constricted him as much that it seems like Larson, like his rookie season, isn't screwing up making the pass after he takes it off of somebody's tape as much as he used to at the end in Edmonton where you take it off of the tape and then immediately give it back to the other team sometimes. And then you'll be like, oh. He's so looked good. Like, he's looked good. So, yeah, like this year he's actually looked really good. And that's why he's been in some trade rumors himself. And Ron Francis has had to say, like, this is kind of one of our leaders and assistant captains were yeah. building this thing around. The thing so. is with Larson is I wrote like a couple of off season pieces just on who the Flyers should target for Flyers Nitty. And I, you know, mentioned him as a target. I really wanted actually the Flyers to go after him just because I liked his defensive game first off. And I thought he could be a solid. Doesn't you know, he only partner. get paid for something too? Yeah, it's about four. It's a good contract yeah. as well. So for what he brings and, and the money, it's great value. So I really wanted them to go after him. Unfortunately, they did not. They targeted Ristolainen and Ellis. And I like the moves at the time. And that's the thing that's hard is that if you look at the moves that Fletcher did make in the offseason, like his trade for... I mean, the Ellis trade, you didn't give up the most um, in terms of, you know, prospects. Obviously, Patrick's been disappointing. Myers has been disappointing. So it looked like that was a good trade. The jury's out because, you know, Myers hasn't played that much. Patrick hasn't played that much. Ellis has virtually not played at all. And then Ristolainen has been decent. Oh, Though, really have yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you could say that all his moves this offseason have worked out. The team's still been bad. So maybe, you know, another offseason at it for Fletcher. Uh, he can build on what he did this past offseason. It'll be interesting to see because it looks like he's kind of the negotiator whereas Flair is the guy who's focused on the prospects in the draft. So we'll see what he does with the cap space that he frees up from getting rid of, like, a JVR, Jer- most likely, Giroux, and then risk the line and probably getting traded. That's a lot of cap space to work with. Hopefully, as we were saying, he doesn't overspend in certain areas for players that probably aren't worth that value of money. I mean, I would ultimately like to see them target, a, you know, Johnny Goudreau to bring in or Philip Forsberg, if you're going to spend that money, at least bring in forwards who are contributors. You know, don't get another Kevin Hayes type where you overpaid him probably by a million a and a million and a half. Forward, you, know, you don't need yeah, enough you, two-way players. You, you need, need a skilled that. guy. You need a skilled yeah. guy, high-end skilled guy. So I'm hoping that's what we see. It's really the jury's out at this point. Who knows? But, yeah. Yeah. I still think when it comes to that, Forsberg is the best because he's just a wire and shoot it guy. Johnny Goudreau is still an overall 
playmaker that can score. Yeah, same Flyers with, still need the snipers. snipers. Yeah, yeah, same with Vladdy. Vladdy's an overall playmaker that can score. Now, if we get either of them, will I be mad? Absolutely not. No. Yeah. But <laughs> now, if we pay them $11 million, will I be then. mad? Absolutely. Yeah, but, <laughs> but I would still be happy we got the player, just won't be happy with Chuck. I mean, uh, if you get them but, for an eight, if you get those guys, let's say you get a Forsberg for an 8.5. Or a Gaudreau for an eight point five, I could live with that because you're almost paying. Yeah. It's almost like you just added two hundred fifty thousand dollars onto Giroux's contract. And also, I think Forsberg's literally a year, like literally a exact year younger than Johnny Gaudreau. It's like the yeah. same date. Year. Wow, I didn't than know Johnny that. Gaudreau. That's funny. Yeah, because I saw that the other day where they were talking about how both are in like the trade route. Like, if the teams decide to move on from them before they get nothing, yeah. where. They're literally the same date. One's 27, one's 28. Floors versus the 27 year old. Johnny's the 28. So it was like funny that they're the same exact date. But as we're closing out, because we mentioned some guys we would pick up um, in the free agency from last year, something I figured might be decent to look at is bring up some names and uh, see what you think of them from some of these guys that sure, are yeah. in. That's this fun. year's. Let me. Yeah, we have. Well, if we get Crystal Tank from Pittsburgh, that'd be fantastic. I, I just don't think he's leaving. To be honest, <laughs> no, he's not leaving. Here's a name. If we can get him for a couple million dollars, I'll throw out there for you because he's not going to get paid anywhere near nine again. PK Subban is a right shot defenseman. I think that's really interesting. Um, and I honestly, I would say if let's say I mean, if you. It, it really depends what they do with all the other defensemen. And I like him on a second pair, right? You're not bringing him to be a first pair guy at this point, or even, if, even if, even if you could get him in as a third pair guy, right? Like it would be interesting to see because obviously they're moving on from wrist Probably their goal is to have, you know, pro overall on the left side on your first pair, Alice on the right side, Sam Sandheim on the left side. Uh, and then if you get Subban in there on the right side for, you know, limited dollars, I think that could be some good value. Um, it would be interesting, though, to see, like, if, if one of Sanheim or Provorov get traded, uh, then you get a Subban in there and then you, you know, go after another, you know, big name UFA guy. Maybe you go after a Klingberg. I'm not the most interested in a guy like Klingberg, but who knows what, you know, Fletcher and, and company are thinking. That's something that could be on their radar as well. But it'd be interesting. Um, I think he still has game left. You just can't play him those top minutes uh, anymore. How about you? Yeah, what do you think yeah, about that? PK, I feel like, I don't know if I'll put him with Travis because then that's going to restrict Travis again from jumping up on the play. Yeah, I feel like PK probably is best with, realistically, the guy that's not up right now. He would be the best with Zamula, whatever Zamula's called up, because Zamula's a two-way defenseman. Yeah. Zamula's a big guy that can play in both ends. PK's a guy you would prefer when he sees an opportunity to jump up and shoot it, to jump up and shoot it. Where so is Sanheim, so you don't necessarily want to have two guys that you prefer to jump up and take advantage of the play on the same line, because then you might get caught coming yeah. back a couple and that, but, but in terms of having him on the team, he's a guy if you pay, say, $3 million or less for a one-year deal to see how he comes in and plays, I, I would be perfectly fine with it's that. Worth it. It's though, worth it. Somebody, though, that you mentioned that I think I have a little bit more interest in than you is Klingberg in the sense of our power play sucks. Well, <laughs> like yeah, that. he's a great yeah. he's a great quarterback. Well, yeah. yeah. And I think he's a guy that could work with Provy because Provy shouldn't be jumping up on the play as much as he does. He should be like the guy Proby. staying back, yeah. Yeah, so if you have John Klingberg with Provy, who's played first line minutes for a, a lot of the time with this, not lately because they have Heisken there and everything, mean, but like for a lot of his days with the Stars, he's played first line minutes. And then you he's get Ellis with Sanheim, maybe? Exactly, yeah. Then you put Ellis with Sanheim, and it kind of fits it into like a perfect mold. And everything, and then if you even get PK and you have Cab York with PK or you have whoever makes the team off the bat, Jamula with PK, because one of those guys is going to make the team, in my opinion, off the I bat agree. next year. Yeah. Um. So, like, I think that would then just uh, strengthen the defense because the one thing I really like from um from Klingberg that none of our defensemen do 
is the ability to always get it through with traffic in front. Yeah. We don't have one defenseman on our team that has the ability to always consistently yeah. other get Other than it. other than Ellis. That's what Ellis is really good at. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Other than Ryan play. Ellis. And imagine if you had Ellis who's great on both ends when healthy while well, being able to do that. And then Klingberg, who's probably the best at doing yeah. it in the league, but is only great on the offensive end. Oh, like, yeah. That seems like a perfect match in a defense. I like, I, that's, a good, that's a good thought. And honestly, I mean, me and Yareev had a podcast where he kind of went through, um, you know, UFAs you'd like to bring in. And I mentioned Klingberg as a name. It's, it's not to say that I don't think his game would fit and I don't like him. It's just I don't know what it's going to cost. And, and that's the thing. You already have so much money tied up in your defense right now. Um, that it might be costly to bring in another like eight million dollars or seven million that Klimberg that's might true. get up. Yeah. So that that's the only thing they gotta watch out for. But also you have a ton of money coming up, coming off the books up front too. So maybe they might be able to make it work. That'd be interesting. What do you think? Um, because I've seen this thrown around uh, by some of the bigger names on Twitter, like a Friedman and Pierre LeBrun. Uh, what do you think of you know the Flyers apparently being interested in a Jeff Petrie from Montreal? Oh, I would like that. I've always liked um, Petrie, even though he's having a down year. I've always thought he's yeah. Guy that, their whole just, team is though. You can't really judge him by that, right? Yeah, I always thought he's a guy that um ha- is going to bounce back and went and put in the right spot. Now, has he said some of the wrong things this year in terms of not necessarily being as dedicated as he should have most of the time? Probably, but if you're, it's all about situational. Yeah, Spot and they're all hu- you're all human beings. Imagine how yeah. hard it would be. Imagine how hard it would be to go from a Stanley Cup contender or literally the Stanley Cup final to being the worst team in the league. Like that's a big change for you as a player, right? So I can understand. Yeah, I mean the, the guy was in that. the Norris conversation last year. He's having a ba- and even two years ago, he's having a bad year this year. Uh, I'm not holding that against him. I think he's still a really good defenseman. Who again, if you bring him in. We have to look at. He does get paid six two five until twenty twenty five. But that would probably be less. That would probably be less than a Klingberg yeah. ultimately. So that it would could probably be, be less than Klingberg. Yeah. So yeah. it could work there, and then you have a flex between who do you want on the first line because you know Peachy can play first line and Ellis can play first line. So you can kind of move them. Uh, you can back see who plays team. better with who. Like you could see, does Alice play better with Pro Rob? Does he play better with Sanheim? Does Petrie play better with Pro Rob? Does he play better with Sanheim? Then yeah. you have your top four. Honestly, a lot of this though, and what we're talking about is kind of hinging on the fact that Ryan Ellis is healthy. So hopefully, I mean, they can figure out what's going on with him. I'm not too sure yet if they've decided whether or not they're going to go a surgery route or not. I think at this point, you might as well just shut him yeah. down. And just let him get healthy because even though you probably want to see him come back at least for 10, 15, 20 games, I don't just I just don't think that's a realistic option for them at this point. No, I don't think it's a smart option either. Uh somebody yeah. though that in this year's free agency, there is a guy who I always thought was one of the more underrated right shot defensemen okay, in the league, which is Colin Miller. Oh, yeah. Colin yeah, Miller yeah. is he, in this year's is free agency. Uh I, he's got paid three eight seven five. Uh, he's 29. He's going on his age 30 season. Uh, he seems like a guy you can bring in, plays pretty good in his own zone, very good at moving the puck up to the uh, forward. So I think he could be that perfect cheap end guy that you can even play on your first line if you need to play him with Provy if Ellis yeah. isn't healthy. But ideally, you're well, you're going to have uh, as your fourth defenseman with Sanheim on, on the second line. That's I think he's a guy, if we're talking about that perfect middle salary guy, he yeah. might be one of those perfect middle salary guys on top of Josh Manson because Josh Manson. Yeah, I he's a guy. Like, I, like seven. He's a yeah. guy I really like. And I was thinking, like, you know, if the team is because it, it seems like Fletcher and, you know, company, they're kind of not obsessed with it, but they're very keyed into the fact that, you know, the team lacked physicality last season. And that's why they kind of targeted Erasmus Ristolainen. Um, and if you're going to trade Ristolainen away, the Flyers once again will lack that element of physicality because even though you have a Zach McEwen and a Ratcliffe in the lineup, Raz still brings it every night in the defensive zone, right? So you, your D core still lacks, you know, physicality there. If you bring a Manson in, I think that kind of replaces that. Though I don't think that Anaheim will let him go, unfortunately, because they they look like they're on on you know the up on and the up. Rise. So yeah, I think they're going to try to keep him. But you know what? If if Fletcher can, if you're going to overpay for anybody. Because I think what is he making? I think four point one two five. Four point one. 
Yeah, uh, let's see here. Josh Manson, Josh Manson. He's something yeah, he like 4. that. 4.1 exactly. Exactly 4.1. Yeah, so if, if you can, I mean, get him in, let's say for a 5 million, 5.5 even for like five, maybe five years, four or five years, I wouldn't be against that at all. Yeah. And another he's a physical guy type that, too. Another guy that's physical that'll be cheaper than that if you want to go with two guys in the more maybe three, nine, four range. If you sign Colin Miller and Connor Murphy to get two righties. Now, Connor yeah. Murphy's a guy from Chicago. He's been a, one of those kind of in the category of late bloomers. In his late 20s is when he really started to see. He's been decent, though, from the Hawks games that I've seen. No, he has been really good. Yeah, yeah, He. that's what I'm saying. I think he falls into the category of what you, Yarif, and I try to talk about a lot, that you can't give up on guys that you see spurts from because if they put it all together, even if it's at 27, 28, they could be what Connor Murphy is now. So um, I think he's a guy you could probably bring in for maybe four, two, four, five, then bring in – uh, Miller for 4-2 to 4-5, and then you have two guys that might give you, not might, probably will give you higher value than their contract uh, for the for that if, you have, if you're forming the defense like we are. And then you kind of go from there. Murphy, though, I would say you would try to bring him in if you could on one or two years because I don't think Wyatt Wiley's that far away from No, and I mean, you got to factor in, too, like personally, the way I'm looking at it is this. Um, I think the Flyers will go out They'll try to get a wrist aligner replacement, obviously, for the top four. And they're going to, you know, hope, okay, Brian Ellis is healthy. And that's a top four set. And then for the, and then they'll probably try to get a bottom pair guy in there and then have, you know, York and Zamula battle it out uh, for that last spot. You yeah. Would you say the same? No, I think that's what's going to happen. And that's why I feel like they might get two right shot guys in the offseason because we're probably going to get rid of Braun as well. As Exa- exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. The only righty that we have then in our system that's really close is Wiley. So yeah. I think you would bring in Miller if you bring in Manson. If he doesn't leave, you bring in Miller, you bring in uh, Murphy. Uh, then you have that and you have two righties in, one that's a physical guy and another that's just a good two-way guy that's going to yeah. the fuck up the ice and Colin Miller. That if he has to, can still lay on a hit, but that's not exactly a um, one game. So. What's your thoughts actually on, I'm wondering, Nazem Kadri? Because there's been a lot of rumors that the Flyer, you know, he's a Flyer, he's a Flyer, that's the way he plays, and the, the Flyers are going to be very aggressive in terms of bringing him in, or trying to. That That's at least what I heard on 32 Thoughts podcast. So I'll give Elliot Friedman and Merrick the benefit of the doubt, because they usually get the, a lot of those things right. So what, what, what do you think on that? I really, in his entire career, even when I – when he's done stupid stuff, just because I do like those gritty players, have been in defense of Nazim Kadri at times. So I do like Nazim Kadri. The problem is Chuck Fletcher. Yeah, he's kind of, <laughs> like, yeah how much is he like, going to pay him? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, like we, we've seen Fletcher in his past when guys have had very good years, like, I don't know, Kevin Hayes, for example, pay him a lot. We've seen him when James Van Riemsdyk only had a – watch, did he play James Van Riemsdyk or was that – That was a hackstall move. That was a excellent move. Yeah, you're right. But we saw the – so even without Fletcher, the Flyers just continue to pay throughout our lifetime contracts like that. If you can get him for – I think he gets paid for something, 4.5. If you could get him for 7 and maybe 7.5 or less, then sure. But I don't think Nazim Kadri is really worth much more than – that I don't even think Hayes. he's worth – And I don't, I don't even, even know if he's necessarily worth that because yeah. this is his peak season. <laughs> like, that, like, you're, like, you would be paying him for – And then you got to factor in, too, that, like, most of the season, like, McKinnon was injured. He was playing with Mika Ranton and Gabriel Landis. Is he going to re- reproduce that in the Flyers? Probably. Yeah, we don't Probably have Mika not. Ranton and Gabriel Landis. Yeah, so I, I think uh, he's a guy the, – the I'm center hoping they I steer clear. After. I'm hoping they steer clear from him. I'm hoping they steer clear of him. The center I would go after to add more size and skill since we already have Ratcliffe in that's playing well. And he's actually a UFA if they decide to just move on from him because Carolina has a bunch of other forwards. Uh, and Montreal doesn't bring him back. Uh, Yasperi Kakaniemi is someone that, since he actually is under the UFA category. I agree, and he's a young I, guy still. He's still a young player. Yeah, he's a, he's a really he's one of those rare, really young guys you can get as a UFA. And uh, he brings some size to you. He brings some skill. He has 11 and 11 this year. 
um, for 22 points in 48 games. If you could just kind of develop him, like we said before, the Flyers have a lot of centers. They don't need to put him on the second line right away. You, if no. you have Hayes and Couturier, you have, they're your top two line guys. And then whoever falls into suit at third line, which could be him, or he could be the fourth line guy. Uh, so I think he's a perfect guy to bring yeah. in for me. And another guy, he's an RFA, though, so I think you would have to trade for his rights, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, but or a offer guy, sheet. Yeah, or offer sheet. A guy that I've had interest in from Chicago, which I don't know if I would offer sheet this guy, but uh, in terms of trading for his rights, is Strom. Oh, since yeah. I said I uh, uh, Derek Smith, I think it is, that coaches their team now. Yeah, Since yeah. he's took over, Strom's been put on the first line. He's playing and a lot better. Really elevated his game. Yeah, he's got back to how he was at the jump, and it seems like he's kind of just told him, be you, and the skating will come, rather than trying to pound down his throat. You need to improve your – like, this is how X, Y, and Z you can improve your skating, where he's kind of just told him, play your yeah. game, and naturally you're going to become like your brother well, did. Yeah, that's what I mean. Look at, his, look at his brother <laughs> in, the, in New York, right, with David Quinn. He just let him play his game, and then – Look at how he's been the last couple seasons. Ryan Strom's been a great player for them. So he's also I a think, free agent, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that could be, you know, maybe an option to look at as well. Um, you know, I guess final thoughts, and this is a hot button topic, I would say, for you know, um, Flyers talk in general right now. What do you think is going to happen going forward with Morgan Frost? What, what what's your perspective, or what what do you want to see happen with him? For me, well, for this year, uh, like I kind of said at the forefront, I would like to just see him play. Let him play the third line minutes. Uh, Brass, we're going to get what we get for Brass. So just let uh, Morgan play in the third line role. And I think next year, if we make the moves that I was suggesting, like you bring in a Kyle Miller, then you bring in a physical defenseman, and you bring in a Cockney Emmy or a Dylan Strom, he's kind there's of no reason to get. There's no reason to really necessarily get rid of Frost because. No. You can have him on the wing. Any of, you can have, yeah. You can either have him on the wing, which some people think might be better for him at the NHL. Level. I think so. Yeah. Or, yeah, or you could just play because um, Kakaniemi, especially if you get him, has played a lot of fourth line. You can grow him from the fourth line up, and then as he starts playing better, move him up. So I think you could easily chill keep Frost in that instance. If you get Strom, you're probably going to want him more as the third line center, but then you could just move Frost to the wing. And you're fine there, too. So I think, for me, I would like to keep him because I think he lost a whole year of development. Exactly. Then so you got to factor year, that in. Yeah. This year he started doing better um, to then get sick at, during the All-Star break. So that's why he couldn't come back up right away. Then he comes up. He actually played well. And Mike Yo said he played well to only scratch him the next game. So go figure <laughs> how the hell that makes sense. That doesn't make uh, a lot so, of sense. Like, the... I think he's played fine. I think they just need to let him be him. What what, what we just yeah. said, Derek Smith has done with Dylan Strom. That's what the Flyers have to do. Yeah, with Morgan Frost. I agree. Table. I so, agree. That, so they just need to take the reins off. Yeah, they just take the take reins the off. off. Let him, yeah, let him be him because we saw what he could do. I mean, his first goal was filthy on Sergei Bobrovsky. Oh, yeah. Back. That backhander <laughs> against the Panthers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you can see what he can do in space, and that's really the player he is. He's not supposed to be Mr. Perfecto on both ends. That's never what no. Morgan Frost is supposed to the be. The thing is, that's though, what that uh, Eric was supposed to be and what he's developing into, but it's not yeah. what Frost. The thing that you know is puzzling to me is Frost has actually looked pretty good to me. I think defensively, like he hasn't had major gaffes. I mean, there's been a couple, you know, times where he's been out for a goal against, but he's a young player. You got to live with the growing pains. I just think with him, I mean, just take the reins off, give him some talent to play with, and just see what the guy can do at this point. Because, as you said, he lost year of development. Um, apparently, the reason, you know, or that they're being so tough on him, uh, and apparently the, this is what, I mean, management thinks. Um, this is what Brent Flair said on Flyers Daily with Jason Martinez uh, when they interviewed him just the other day, is that, um, you know, they aren't um, satisfied with his pace of play. They noticed that he kind of stops moving his feet and they want him to, you know, keep moving his feet and playing as fast as he can. And that's apparently like a, a playing and coaching note that they've given him. And that's kind of where they want to see the improvement. That might be like kind of where you see the scratchings happen. But first off, you're playing with Max Wilman and Jerry Mayhew who aren't, you know, NHL up to speed guys. You would say they're kind of, you know, AHL players uh, that have just gotten this opportunity this season. So 
what do you expect from the guy in that situation, right? Like my overall ultimate goal and what I think the team needs to do going forward with Frost is once Giroux's traded, put Frost in that position and you'd say you're you're throwing him to the wolves on, on the first line, but who are you going to play there? Scott Lawton? Like, I guess you can do that, but might as well give Frost Fairby, give Frost Atkinson, two guys that are good in, his own end, in their own end defensively and let him play with those talented guys and show that he can produce at the NHL level offensively, get, let him, you know, develop some confidence for himself because it seems like it's really lacking in his offensive game. That's something that should be the strong point of his game, not the weak point, right? No, yeah, and I also think Frost has looked better. Def- and Yo's even said that that's why it didn't make sense to bench him in, the, in today's game. Yeah. Um, where <laughs> for Broussard, think, too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, he's a guy... You have to, like you said, just let the reins off. For me, the, the, that's the way that the Flyers had to do with a lot of guys, which seemed like they did. They uh, have done it with uh, – they just let Rackliff be him since coming up. Um, a guy they haven't seemed to mess with since he's come up, since he's been great, is Fairby. So, like, there's guys they just let be them and see and they see success, so I don't know why they don't do it more. I think um, it's more so, of guys who are stronger on the defensive side of things. They kind of seem to like let them do their thing. Whereas Frost, I guess, was never labeled to be like a defensive stalwart. So it seems like there's more coaching involved there. At least that's for my yeah, perspective. But at the Obviously, same we time, don't know. But yeah, at the same time, that goes to what we said with getting gritty with it. You should let somebody develop great at their strength first before you start slamming them with a bunch of other stuff when they haven't even fully developed. Uh, ho- and so. hopefully with the new development staff that they've kind of hired and Alan McCauley and then Briere apparently being more, you know, vocal and just more involved on that side of things. Hopefully that's something they kind of gear towards with the prospects moving forward. I guess it's only time will tell, but I think Briere and those new hires can really help there. At least that's what I'm hoping anyway. Yeah. And also I think with development, they're going to really like how to, you're going to see the cases of the world. Uh, well, Jackson even too continue, but, but Noah, especially, as he comes into the system with these new player development people, which only going to continue to help those guys and Lozinski's of the world. But we also didn't mention, we might not even need a fourth line center because we have Tanner Lozinski, who is probably going to be playing, probably would have, probably would have been playing this year as an NHL guy if he wasn't injured for most of the season. So there is that um, as well. So there, there are guys, even with the Phantoms, that probably would have made an impact like the Wade Allison, the Lozinski's of the world. Even maybe Forster at this point with the way the team's playing. Yeah. But they didn't I mean, have the option. Yeah, they didn't have that option because of uh injuries. And that's just that's just is what it is. But Vasilia, if you have any place you want uh, people to follow you at and check you out, uh, you can uh, hand those over now. I really appreciate you hopping on. Yeah, of course. It was a pleasure, Joe. Always love talking some uh, hockey with you. And I'm sure, you know, I'll be on in the future and we'll have you on getting gritty with it as well coming up for a hundredth episode. So that'll be fun uh, for everybody, you know, who's listening to this. Thank you so much for the support and, and for supporting, you know, Joe and myself and, and all the content that goes out on Flyers Nitty Gritty as well as, you know, uh, Philly Sports Fanatic as well. Uh, you guys can follow me at Flyer at Flyer It Up on Twitter. Uh, and should have some articles, you know, coming soon as well on Flyers Nitty Gritty. So look forward to uh, you all hopefully checking that out. Yeah, and then you guys can check me out at uh, JJ426 on Twitter, Sports Fanatic News on YouTube. My one closing thought uh, would be, even though I don't think he's a steady NHL player, um, I do think there's two people from – the depth department, I would say you should keep in the organization. The bigger one is Jerry Mayhew because of how well he played. In his I time think on the fourth season. line, he would be perfect. Well, yeah, I'm not even saying just to play in the NHL. I'm just saying you should give him yeah. another two-way contract with the way he's shown he can perform in a depth situation. I agree. And then he's played great for the Phantom. Another guy I would give a two-way to, kind of like the Penguins just did the Chad Ruweedle, but I think they gave him a one-way for 800, gave this guy a two-way for 750. Is Sealer because Sealer didn't even play all of last season, and out of the Yandel Sealer and Canadian group, he's been by far the best out of all. For three. a seventh, for a seventh D, I have no problem with Sealer. Yeah, he becomes an and every night guy. Yeah, no, not I mean, an every night guy, but as a depth yeah. guy that's playing like he was supposed to be as a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that that's what I was meant to say. Like when he becomes an every night guy, then it's the problem. But once he's when he's your seventh, that's perfect, and I think bringing him back even in that role would be fine. For me, just last takeaway I would like to say just about this game and that that just happened this afternoon in general for the Flyers coming up uh, rest of the season here is 
I think, you know, fans want to see the team obviously improve their draft uh, position as much as they can. So obviously that comes with the team losing. Don't be mad when the team wins a game like this one. And the reason is there's going to be a ton of guys that are still on this team moving forward. So you want to see them develop that winning culture, the right habits, learning how to close out close games, learning how to win close games, because if they're going to be successful moving forward, those are all, you know, key facets of being a winning team, learning how to close out, uh, you know, close game, learning how to play with the lead, things like that. So seeing that happen today that they could play with the lead and close out a game is a positive for all these young guys development moving forward. And that's, that would be my opinion. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. Well, that's a great way to close it out. This has been the latest edition of the grittiest take where we recap some of today's game for you. And then went into the whole state of affairs of the team talked about some guys we think could be on the move and even gave you some free agency preview really early on free agency preview. So that's interesting as well. I have a safe day, everybody enjoy your rest of your weekend and go Flyers.